Hey, Maureen. You got my invitation, okay? Hey, Chris. Hello, how's it going? Good, how are you tonight, sir? Good. I'm jealous of your background. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Penny. Hey there. Oops, oops, oops. Let's see if my connection needs to be fixed. Look good um, so far. Uh, my, my end says it's waiting. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I think all of our internets are getting tired. <laughs> that's going to work out, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, what's going on here? Let me go check my settings. Hold on. I'm going to go check the settings. Yeah. yeah, we have your audio, we just don't have any video. Hey, Valerie. Oh. I don't know. It says I'm connected pretty well, so. Yep, you're coming through. You're coming through clear. Okay. I'm gonna reboot. Hey, Caitlin. Hey. Caitlin, Jamie. How's it going? Counselor uh, Gabrielson uh, will be joining us uh, already in progress. He's uh, currently on at the Fort Williams Park uh, Zoom meeting on the uh, RFP review right now, and the, he'd emailed to say he was running a little, a uh, little long, but he'll probably come in about fifteen or twenty minutes uh, after seven. Okay. I had to reboot. <laughs> Valerie. Hey, I'm here. I'll be right back. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump in and out. Um, for some reason, my mic's not working. The uh, iPad mic's working, but my headphones aren't. So I'll be right back. OK. Hi, Maureen. How are you doing? Oh, just great. Good. Say it with a little enthusiasm. Well, <laughs> I have a huge amount of Jordan strawberry, so I'm actually I'm doing pretty good right now. <laughs> Look at strawberry fields right behind me. <laughs> right. We were picking those today. 
Well, I think I know where some of them are. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So I apologize about the crying baby in the background. <laughs> um, so I guess we can get started. Let me just pull up my agenda. Getting used to having things on two devices. Um, and I was thinking um, this evening, I know it's a workshop, but since this has been mostly an ordinance committee issue that it makes a little more sense for um, Penny to sort of direct things as we get into the meeting, if that works. I was going to ask that you do it because I've been working hard all day, but you have a baby. <laughs> I go, <laughs> how about if we double, how about if we team it there, Valerie? How's that? Yeah, no, we can definitely do that. But you know, if it if we get into yeah. a point where it, it feels like oh, definitely we, we should direct and, a little uh, more, please feel free. And, yeah, and Jamie and Chris have been immersed as well, so yeah, it'll be the ultimate workshop. Yes, it will be. It's a big one. Chairman um, Adams, uh, Councillor Gabrielson will be joining us uh, in about fifteen or twenty minutes after seven. He's uh, currently at the. Uh, Fort Williams Park Committee review of okay. the RFPs for the master planning update. Okay. Okay. And he just said he's going to be a little bit behind, so I just wanted to let you know. Okay, that sounds good. Um, okay, so we'll get started. It looks like we have some attendees, and um, we will begin by giving those individuals an opportunity to comment. Um, I know the ordinance committee meetings have been a little more back and forth, but because we've gotten to this workshop stage with the council. Um, I'd like to have the public comment during the public comment period as much as possible so that we can um, make some work on the on the ordinance. Um, it would be less of a back and forth, although I do think that's been very beneficial in the ordinance committee to, to have that. So um, the floor is open for public comment. You can use the raise hand feature in Zoom um, please limit comments to about three minutes per person so that everyone can have an opportunity to talk. Uh, Penny Pollard, could you please unmute Matt? Penny, your uh, microphone should now be live. Good evening, counselors. Um, my name is Penny Pollard. I live in a short term rental owner in People's Cove here in Cape Um I have two questions. Um, number one, I'm wondering if we can view anywhere as a public record a breakdown of complaints filed against individual short-term rental owners by number of complaints filed per licensed short-term rental property owner versus aggregate. I don't mean names and addresses. I mean, something that you've used that a great number of individual licensed short-term rental properties are having complaints filed against them. Um, and then my second question has to do with um, the fact that I'm certain that you've considered in your deliberations that most vacation renters cannot afford nor have the vacation time from work available to stay in a rental property for 30 days. Uh, in my case, most of our visitors have been delighted to be able to come to Cape Elizabeth for a week. And many of our visitors have come to attend family events close by. So I'm asking if you would uh, kindly address the short-term rental owners in the town who have been respectfully renting their properties for years without complaint will now be prevented from renting to tenants who have been coming to Cape Elizabeth in some cases for decades. Thanks very much. Um, so I think what, what we'll do is kind of keep those comments in mind um, and come back to that when we get into the discussion portion. Um, so we'll take a comment from Ann Carney. Hi, thank you. Um, 
everyone. I, I have a, I'm Ann Carney. I'm a state representative for House District 30, Cape Elizabeth, and I live at 21 Angel Point Road. And I have a concern about the um, primary residence unhosted provision of the ordinance because I feel like if the one of the stated purposes of the ordinance is to basically um, preserve the character of neighborhoods and to maintain housing available for long-term residents. And when you look at um, section two, and I just lost it here, hang on a second, the primary residence unhosted, to me that extensive use of um, a primary residence as an unhosted uh, uh, short-term rental, that's a half a year. And to me, that just doesn't seem no. to hit the mark that is um, that the ordinance is striving to achieve. I would like to see an ordinance that prioritizes uh, residential use in residential zones more strongly than this one does. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jill Seaman. Hi, hi, thank you. Um, I had sent an email a couple weeks ago and didn't get confirmation it was received. So I just wanted to, this is my first meeting um, in regards to this. And I just wanted to um, share another voice for someone who is in the town. My mother grew up in the town. I spent summers in the town. Um, I live in Massachusetts and I was fortunate enough to buy my dream house last uh, 2018. And part of me being able to do that now with the goal of moving up there with the current ordinances, the short term rentals and being able to rent. Um, I'm a single mother. I have a school aged daughter and the time we spend there is amazing. But as Penny mentioned, I can't take tons of vacation time. So and I live in the same area. I live at 30. Or my house is at 34 Shipwreck Cove in Peebles Cove. So I the first thing I did was contact Ben McDougal, had him come out. I hired a realtor. I did everything by the book. There's been no complaints. I've made sure that I've talked to every neighbor in the neighborhood, have given them my information if there's ever a problem. And I just feel like it's, it's horrible if I'm not going to be able to afford this house anymore if you change the ordinances. So you know, if we're doing the right thing, I think, yes, it should be a minimum of a week. I think, you know, raise the permit fees if you need to so that we can regulate it more. But I would be so upset if I have to end up selling my house because I can't afford it anymore. So I just hope that you'll take that into account as well. Hey, Valerie. Yes. I just, I had two quick things on that. I know we're gonna discuss, but number one is I, I went back through my emails while Ms. Seaman was talking. I, I, I don't receive, I don't, didn't recall the name at all. Yeah. And I don't see any email from you. So um, if you wouldn't mind resending that, if you still have it, um, I certainly don't have any, um, any email. Um, and then would you mind just restating your situation that you started off at the beginning, because I just didn't catch all of it. Sure. Um, what I had said was that my mother grew up on Mitchell Road, and yeah. I've been, and and that um, I would come up every summer and Christmas, and, and my goal is to move up there permanently. But as of right now, I work full time, and I have a school aged daughter, um, so that when I did the analysis to be able to purchase this house now instead of later on, it was based on being able to rent it. So where and is I your primary that. residence? Massachusetts. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't catch that. I, I wasn't yeah. clear on that. No, okay. that's okay. And um, also, I sent the email to Matt Sturgis and Ben McDougall directly. I didn't have everyone else's information. Okay. Yeah. Matt, did you want to comment on that? Yes, uh, Ms. Seaman, I, I apologize. I thought that had gone to the entire council and I have since I just forwarded it to councilors. You should all have that in your inbox at this moment in time. So I apologize. I thought that had, had gone to all the councilors before. So, but you do have it now. Thanks. Thank um, okay. Um, 
Anyone else from the public wishing to comment at this point? Um, this is, yes, uh, Scott Dobos. Hello, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is, is safe and well. Um, my name is Scott Dobos. Uh, I live at 8 Farmhouse Road in Scarborough. Uh, I, I run the rental division for Legacy Properties, Sotheby's International Realty. Um, I, I have the pleasure of working with uh, off and on uh, nearly 20 different property owners in, in Cape Elizabeth um, with all, all sorts of rentals from long-term traditional rentals, uh, winter quote unquote school year rentals, uh, seasonal summer rentals, as well as uh, weekly uh, vacation rentals uh, or, or greater. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to offer uh, another comment on, you know, shining a light on the difference between uh, a professional vacation rental manager uh, that's navigating short-term rentals for an out-of-state owner, um, such as uh, Ms. Seaman. Uh, she, she, I don't, I don't work with her, but she, she works with a professional vacation rental manager. Uh, and, and I, I, it, it's not, it's not a coincidence that she hasn't had any complaints. It's uh it's, it's a very different run um, program while working with someone who uh, their, their entire motivation is to make sure the neighbors are, are happy. Uh, the guests are happy and, and having a, a blissful vacation and the owners are, um, happy with the service that they're providing and, and want to continue working with them. Um, the, some of the, the difficulties in, in CAPE is um, the, the, the problem issues. Um, I, I think th there are other ways to address it besides uh, elimination. And I think some of the difficulties with out-of-state owners with some of the problem properties, that's, it's not a coincidence that they're not working with a um, professional rental manager, uh, and it doesn't have to be my, myself or the company that uh, Ms. Seaman uses. It could be um, uh, several other uh, companies uh, in the area, and I think that would make a, a pretty significant difference in the impact of short-term rentals in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I just want to um, remind individuals here that the format of the workshop meeting is usually that public comment is just at the beginning. Um, we did get a number of emails and I see some individuals here who we received emails from. So um, we, we've read those and heard what you have to say. Um, but if there's anyone else who wishes to comment, this is, this is your opportunity at this workshop. All right, seeing no one. Um, we will close the public comment period and just jump right into this fun issue. Can I, oh. Yes, can I? D. I just wanted to let everyone know that there are um, 14 attendees so that people who are attending know that um, we do have 14 people um, attending. Thank you. I'll try to remember to do that. <laughs> to note that in the future. Um, Penny, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I want to say right up front, um, and I think people have been engaged in this um, um, process through the Ordinance, Ordinance Committee, Committee over the last, the last. Oh, I'm getting feedback from somebody. Um, over the last, um, I don't know, it seems like a year. Um, it's been a, a difficult issue for me to, to grapple with. And I say that because um, uh, I, I know Cape Elizabeth and I know that um, areas such as People's Cove and others have been um, uh, summer places, summer residents for many generations. Um, I also know that what we've heard from many, uh, from uh, several neighborhoods have to do with um, the issues and challenges around the short-term rentals. Um, and as we uh, peeled the onion and worked through the issues, um, 
to um, start to craft something that um, addresses each neighborhood differently becomes a little becomes unwieldy. So I hear what everybody is saying about their their homes and their decisions for purchasing. And um, I I just want to say this is not an an easy issue. Uh, it's difficult for me um, personally, emotionally, and and professionally. Um, and so, and I don't take it lightly what, uh, as we deliberate this ordinance, um, where we might, where we might land. So I just want everybody to know that they, they have been heard. I take each of the comments extremely, extremely, um, seriously because Cape Elizabeth as it has been and how I always want it to be, um, maybe going through a bit of a transformation. But I saw that with Broad Cove being built also. Um, and that was a hard thing. So I just want everybody to know that they have been heard. It's not an easy decision. And um, each one of us have um, had to uh, maybe make some choices and decisions that um, are really difficult. Thanks, Penny. Um, and just to respond to a question that was posed, I think, by um, Ms. Pollard. Um, I don't, I, I was on the ordinance committee for the first part, but not the second part of this, and we started quite a while ago. I know at some point um, Ben had brought in uh, some complaints. We did at some point consider complaints um, that had been received, but that wasn't necessarily um, part of the overall crafting of the ordinance at that point. So I don't know if anyone on the committee wanted to speak to that question. Um, Jamie, did you have a response to Ms. Pollard? Yeah, um, I think it's part of the the record and minutes of, of the committee um, because th there was an actual formal request that um, a citizen who had been regularly attending the meetings had made. So um, I don't have that information right in front of me, but I know that somebody else had requested it and, and that information was provided. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to specifically offer in response to Ms. Pollard as well is um, sort of there's a lot of things that we're trying to address both sort of reactively but also proactively in some of the um, changes and revisions uh, that we have developed and, and collectively now are considering. And one of those things that we're trying to well, I guess it's, it, it would be considered both reactive and proactive, but the amount of growth that has happened um, in the um, organized short-term rental business uh, in just the last several years um, in Southern Maine and in Cape Elizabeth um, has been rather exponential. Um, I think we, we used as a, a reference point at, at one point a, a recent Press Herald article that cited just Airbnbs um, uptick alone, which was more than fourfold in, in just a couple of years. Um, the number of properties uh, that are unregistered in Cape, far outpacing those that are registered, is indicative of, of a lot of growth in this area. And so one of the things that's part of the purpose is not just to address problem behavior and problem, um, uh, you know, problem operators, but also to a degree curtail the growth, um, which has been quite rapid um, of these types of places to begin with, because that's inconsistent with um, elements of our comprehensive plan and uh, just other, I think, sort of uh, agreed expectations of, of what folks want the town and their neighborhoods to be. So, um, so it, it it's not that these 
revisions are meant specifically to address just one individual concern, but rather be applied um, to a number of different issues and try and head off a number of possible future issues um, that might happen um, as a result. So. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, Chris. I just want to uh, one aspect that Jamie mentioned there, um, and I, I'm not going to support the ordinance as it's drafted currently, um, but I'm just going to sit quiet and let you guys draft away. Um, but the he mentioned the comprehensive plan, and to me, that's the, as I mentioned at the town council meeting, um, that to me is the issue right now here, is that um, there has been no discussion as to how this changes in basic harmony with the comprehensive plan. Uh, in fact, the only discussion that I recall has been how it is clearly not in harmony with the comprehensive plan. Uh, there's been no discussion of how it is in harmony with the RA, the RB, the RC, how it implements the comprehensive plan. Instead, it's that it's contrary to what we intend with the comprehensive plan. And uh, with that said, that's all I've got to say. Thanks, Chris. Um, okay. Y yes. I just want to address um, one comment um, made about um, professional property management companies and just let you know that um, last week we had two very serious complaints uh, made about short term rentals. And this is while we have a, um, a ban on the rentals. And both of those rentals were um, had property managers. So um, there are instances where we do have property management companies managing properties. One, I believe, was out of state. And um, we had problems with both of them. So I just wanted to address that issue. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, we did have some back and forth about, um, about that particular issue. Um, okay, so I don't know if anyone's ready to jump in and get started. I, like Chris, will not be supporting the ordinance as drafted um, and perhaps have a more radical position than he, um, which is that all short-term rentals should be hosted and severely limited. Um, but I did have some thoughts on the particular points of the ordinance that I thought should be changed. I don't know though if someone else um, wanted to get started before I get into those. Do we? Valerie? Yes. Um, I know I um, at our last meeting, we we basically had um, um, come to some level of a consensus around um, primary residence as kind of a given, and um, and we had uh, progressed to that hosted versus non-hosted and and what the um, length of stays would be. So we had kind of to that point with um, and knowing that we needed to come back and make some decisions around that and we had I just want to bring you up to date with with where we were we also had a discussion on the uh, on the seven uh, acres and the uh, greater than seven acres and the uh, unhosted so that's kind of where where we ended up so um and so i think it makes sense at this point in time for you to jump in and say where you see in those spaces where uh, you might propose thoughts and ideas is that kind of where you are headed yeah okay cool um do we can we put a document on the screen i it looks like i have a screen share option um, so I'm happy to put that up. It's just going to take me a minute to, to pull it up here. I don't know if Matt or if you have it more readily available. 
Would you like the uh, uh, the uh, proposed STR ordinance amendments or the uh, or the memo from the ordinance committee? Yeah, the proposed amendments. I will, I can get that I can get that right up, Chairman Adams. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. Okay, so while he's pulling that up, I, my first thought, um, um, the sort of the perspective that I'm coming from is both that I've heard the concerns that people raised about safety and um, fabric of the community. And from my perspective, you know, we should really be looking at how can we promote diversity in our community? How can we promote safe, communities with long-term residents and having many of these kinds of short-term rentals eats away at those things. And especially right now where we're going to be revisiting the topic of diversity in our community, um, I think it's as important as ever to create where we can in a, in a community that has limited housing stock and limited ability to make more. Um, to make the most use of the housing stock that exists for families who want to come live here um, full time and participate in our community year round. And it doesn't mean that, that I don't think that people should never come here if they're not planning on staying full time, but in the interest of, of using that housing, maximizing that housing for the use it was intended for, which is residents, um, I think it's really important that we look very carefully at these kinds of ordinances. So that's sort of my jumping off point. But I do think that there are some places where we can come to a consensus, at least a few points in the ordinance. And so I did note some thoughts um, in those areas that you noted, Penny. Um, okay. So on the seven plus acre issue. Um, my thought on that was, I, I remember we had discussed this, um, that some of those properties, although they may be seven plus acres, actually are fairly close to other residences. And so, because they may have unbuildable areas on the lot. And so the actual buildable areas is right up against other houses. Um, so my thought for that was, is there something we can put into the ordinance? Um, how many of these potential short-term residences are on those types of properties? And does it make sense if there aren't that many of them um, to just make those be a, a conditional use type short-term rental that if someone with that property wants to use it for a short-term rental then they need a conditional use permit um, and that way it can be you know the the board can look closely at how how close in space is this to other properties is it going to violate the spirit of the ordinance essentially Um, and my other thought on the seven plus acres was, um, you know, I, I do think that they should be, that any short-term rental should be a primary residence. Um, but with those ones, you know, they may be less likely to be rented as a long-term option. Um, during that period of time that, you know, that person is not a full-time resident, which obviously they wouldn't be if they're doing short-term rental. Um, it may not make sense to do a long-term residence or a long-term rental. That might be a little more appropriate for a short-term rental. Um, I also had a thought on uh, penalties. I know we had talked about a monetary penalty and I didn't know what happened with that in, in the committee after I left. Did you guys decide against monetary penalties? Um, the discussion, I'll jump in the discussion on penalties um, in, 
with input from some of the current operators, the understanding was loss of permit resulting in their loss of ability to actually operate as a short-term rental was actually more of a, a deterrent. Um, and, you know, so in effect, if, if, if they wind up having to cancel a bunch of bookings because they've lost their permit because of violation of the ordinance, um, you know, in many cases, they may have trouble reestablishing themselves on that platform to begin with. So, um, but the, the loss of ability to actually operate seemed like a greater uh, financial deterrent than, than actually trying to find folks. Okay, I guess that, that makes sense. Um, also, I think the, the one thing that we had done was if, if they, if for their first offense, if they were to be operating without a permit, um, with most other things, uh, as was pointed out to us by the town planner, with most other things, if, if, if you're late or um, found to be operating without sufficient permit for something, the, the fee is typically double of whatever, uh, there's a certain grace period, but the, otherwise the fee is typically about double, um, you know, what the, what the non-penalty fee is. Um, so in, you know, there could be, you know, legitimate and, and reasonable reasons that somebody might be, we have, we've structured it. So the permits are, uh, run on, on a calendar year. So regardless of what time of the year you come in, um, you have to pay for the full year permit. Mm -hmm. But, um, if you're 30 days past January one and you've gotten to renew or you, you know, so on and so forth, you know, there'd be some level of, um, reasonable accommodation by by having that fee be double as opposed to more punitive um i think the, the more the more punitive penalties of losing the privilege of operating come upon second violation so okay um the other question i had in terms of enforcement um was we had gotten an email about uh complaint coming in um, and code enforcement officer noted that there were some violations, but the property owner had denied that that was true. I, I think it was an issue. There were people who, I think the email said there was evidence that these individuals were tenants. The property owner said they are guests and I didn't know if you guys had had any discussion about um, the findings of the code enforcement officer and giving, giving him that freedom to make those findings or something along those lines. Was there some discussion in the committee about that? Are you saying does Ben have the authority to make a decision relative to findings? Right. Is there something about how, um, did you talk about, I see Maureen has her hand raised, I think. I don't want to jump in here, and, uh, but I think that that particular complaint has been addressed in the draft and there have been situations where uh, there's turnover of people using the property and the claim made to the code officer is, well, I didn't rent it. It was my friends. It was my family. It was my third cousin. And um, the draft actually says any, once you obtain a short-term rental permit, you are living with that, that the rules of a short-term rental permit for the year. So any use of the property, even a non-compensated use of the property counts towards your short-term rental period. Okay. So I think that that pulls Ben out of the situation of having to figure out whether someone is a renter or, you know, they're trying to um, say it's a family member or a friend, doesn't have to make that determination under this draft. Okay. Um, all right. So those were kind of the questions 
and oh, I had one more question. Um, and this I may have just overlooked in the draft. Um, are the so what what is the penalty? And this was kind of along the lines of the monetary penalty. What is the penalty if someone's operating a a non permitted short term rental? <laughs> so do you want me to address that? Yes, if you have been answered, absolutely. Okay, so under this section C short term rental requirements, this is again a new a new provision because that was one of the problems the code officer had is that people were not having a permit. So they were in violation of the zoning ordinance, but because they didn't have a short term rental permit, they weren't necessarily in violation of the short term rental rules. So there's a whole new provision in here that says you have to have a permit if you don't, if the first time you're discovered not to have a permit, you have to pay double the permit fee. Uh, the second time you are found to be operating a short term rental without a permit, you are going to be prohibited from obtaining a permit for one year. Um, and then there's a 30 day uh, provision. The, the thing that, I mean, I know I've talked to the code officer about this. And so, you know, his feeling is that if he finds this out, he's going to be sending it to the attorney. Yeah, and I think. What I would add is the second and important component of this is that unlike what we have today uh, with the additional layer of a third party company and platform um, helping us to better identify who might be conducting uh, short term rental operations um, we will more easily be able to find those that don't have a permit and go after them much more proactively than we can today, where it's, it's a much more manual process and there's been a lot of people flying under the radar. And part of that has been because of the inconsistencies in our current regulation, um, you know, with, with there being multiple, multiple rental types and, and, and people trying to, you know, slide in between those rules. So, um, I, I feel confident that we'll be able to to catch more of the violators and have more, um, you know, more opportunity to get them permitted. And if they continue to violate uh, or have other violations of the ordinance, then we have a much more a, a much stiffer penalty for them after that. So, yeah, uh, Valerie, go ahead. I um I. I'd really like something with more teeth in it. I think that um, double the permit fee, what are our permits? What, $200, so that'd be $400. South Portland has a $1,000 per day penalty for the first offense, $1,500 a day for second offense, and then you go, you're, you're um, suspended for a year. You cannot get a, regist register it for a year. You can't get a permit for a year. I think something with more teeth might um, might be better because we have a lot of people running short-term rentals. We have one code enforcement officer. Even if we have um, this the new code, enf code enforcement that we're looking at, it still may take days or weeks for um, Ben to be able to get out there or discover someone. I think that if it was if you're renting for 5,000 or 10,000 a week, what is, you know, double the permit fee? Um, it just seems like I'd like to see something with more teeth in it. I think that Jamie and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we have, and we have not calculated the new permit fee because we don't know what all of the costs are going to be to operate the short term rental, uh, uh, program or um, because there's going to be additional costs associated if we agree to um, use an outside um, source to kind of help us with uh, tracking and monitoring. So we haven't really calculated what that fee structure would look like. Is that true, Chris and Jamie? That's my understanding. Oh, 
so in essence, it could end up being um, as significant as, um, as South Portland, which I agree with you, um, Valerie, that um, we do need to have it uh, uh, have some teeth in it. So I think keeping that in mind, those numbers as we uh, develop what that permit fee will be, then we can uh, incorporate that. Jamie, did you also have a response to that? Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I totally, I, I mean, I agree with this and I appreciate the comment you're making, um, Valerie. I, I, I think what we're just trying to balance is, well, what about what could, like I said, be very legitimate reasons where, you know, somebody just forgot or they lost track of, you know, like, I mean, you know, think about any of the other, you know, think about your motor vehicle registration or even things as mundane as a dog license that, you know, you come in late on and um, uh, whether or not on a, on such a punitive basis of a, like something like you would describe the South, I mean, we talked about that and, you know, a thousand dollars a day for somebody making a, a simple and legitimate mistake seemed a little draconian to us, but I, I know that what we're talking about here is people willfully trying to avoid or skirt the rules versus people that are making honest mistakes and how do you handle both of those situations, so. Uh, if I just, just respond for a moment. Um, we could put something in there um, that says, you know, unless good cause is shown that would prevent um, future violations or some sort of good cause in there that way if it was just an accident but typically it just like if you're going to drive a car you know you need a driver's license if you're going to run a short-term rental you you know you need a permit um, so I think we could throw something in there saying you know for good cause we can um, I guess our code enforcement officer could choose not to levy the fine for good cause shown. I, I think we can get into um, maybe talking about the details of that. I wanted to kind of do sort of a broad overview and then. Can I just make a quick point? Specific points. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. And, so, and then Caitlin also has her hand raised after Chris. A uh, quick point on the financial and why I'm not a fan of it is that a thousand dollar fine a day um, won't mean much to someone that's renting a building out for 20,000 a week, but it can be crushing for someone that only makes $30,000 a year in their regular day job. So uh, financial penalties, unless you tailor them to account for that, um, I, I, I normally view them as onerous and unfair. Uh, moreover, I also don't like leaving things up to the discretion uh, because often if things are left to discretion and enforcement, uh, they're not applied uniformly. So I like bright line rules for that reason. That's it. Caitlin, did you have a, did you want to jump in on that? I was just going to comment on Valerie's and about the dental it just opens us and Ben up to have to be deciding whose reason is good for giving an exception and whose isn't. It just it's not clear cut enough. So I, I I don't agree with that idea. That's all. Okay. Um, actually, yes, Maureen. I. I I think you said earlier this is something where you can fine tune it later, but I just wanted the council to know that we are receiving RFP bids for the third party enforcement and the numbers that we have given you before seem to be right in the same range. So permit fees in the 100 to $200 range and of course the final decision is yours and what you want them to cover, but just to give you some context for what this what you're discussing. Thank you. So I guess before we go any further, it may be a good idea to just kind of take a poll um, from the counselors about who would support the ordinance as written, as revised. 
And it, can you just use the raise hand feature? So um, it's a little easier to see that, I think. Uh, I'll raise my hand, but I, I, I'd say almost completely as there's a few little things. Um, right. But uh, I'd say I'm, I'm in support of about 90% of what's here. Okay. And you too, Penny? That's exactly what I, I was going to say. There are some nuances, but in essence, um, I'm in uh, support. I was going to say the same thing. A, a few little tweaks. Okay. So, so Kate and, Kate and Jamie, a few little tweaks. Um, and from, um, sorry to, to call you out, but um, Valerie and Jeremy and Chris, um, are you in the, I know Chris is sort of a, a broad no, so I guess Valerie and Jeremy, um, are you in the, there are a few points or are you more of the broad no and you could work maybe towards something? Valerie, go ahead. I, I agree with um, with Jamie and Penny. I agree with 90, 95% of this and think it needs just a few tweaks. Okay. Um, and Jeremy, where are you, are you here? Is Jeremy? Yep, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I keep going back and forth, honestly. Um, I, I appreciate the work that the committee's put in. I think this looks like a workable framework. Um, my personal preference, I think, leans more closely to where you are, Valerie, in terms of wanting to have something that is simple and straightforward, at, you know, hosted rentals only, uh, more in line with what, what South Portland has. I think I could support this, but yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still struggling with it. Okay. So since it appears the majority of counselors are in the few little tweaks area, it may make more sense to identify what those tweaks are for discussion tonight than um, to start with sort of my thoughts, which I think are, are pretty far away from the general consensus. Um, so do you just want to do some sort of noting what those tweaks, what areas those are, I'll make a list and then we can go through that. I have fees and penalties as one of them. So if anyone just wants to jump in with what their points are. Um, Jam Jamie. So I liked, um, and we got a lot of emails in the past few days um, from people that, um, you know, they wanted us to go further in terms of the, the limiting the number of of um, days uh, to operate. But um, while I don't agree with some of those points, I, I did like a lot of the language that we were hearing about being much more clear and sort of affirmative in the language we choose to use around primary residence being the requirement and, and sort of threshold. Um, mm -hmm. And it may seem like nuance, but I, I think as, as we um, as we really try and use that as the foundational piece of, of the ordinance, um, that language can be a little bit stronger. So I, I think we saw some good examples and recommendations of, um, as opposed to being, you know, oh, well, we're, we're prioritizing the primary, you know, it can only be done in a primary residence with these few exceptions is I think much more clear and, and, and affirmative language that I, I would like to see us sort of go back and, and um, edit into this. So that's not one specific line or one specific paragraph or section of the ordinance, but just a general, a, a, a general piece of feedback that I thought was helpful from, from some of what we'd gotten from the public this week. So <clears throat> primary residence language. Um, all right. Anyone else with a, with a point that they think needs tweaking, we can sort of come back to here. Um, yes, Valerie. 
I think uh, the same thing that Jamie said, and also the rental periods, we have to really get that clear what our rental periods are. And um, enforcement, around enforcement, we have to um, make that very clear about enforcement. The other thing is nowhere in there do we say um, that short-term renters cannot sublet. Maybe we don't need that but I just thought that it might be um, something important to put in there that um, short-term renters cannot sublet. Okay. So are you saying that people who are renting from somebody cannot sublet to somebody else? Correct. I'm meaning uh, the person who's short-term renting. Okay, okay. Um, all right. Um, other areas that people believe need tweaking, Jeremy. I, um, I'm I'm not a big fan of category four, the short term rental adjacent. Um, I understand the rationale for why that was brought in, um, but I, I it, it it seems it seems somewhat arbitrary in terms of what might be considered adjacent and not. And I think it just opens up a lot of problem areas that I'm, I, I, I'm not, a fan, not a fan of that. Can I, I can it, Jeremy, can you start that again? You broke up a bit on this end. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I was the category for the short term rental adjacent category. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of that category. I understand why it was brought in that there, and, but um, it seems like, um, it seems like it opens us up for a lot of, of complaints of people saying, well, geez, it's just one lot over and, um, or it's just across the road, you know, and, and, and it, I, I don't, I think it makes the, it, it takes away from the clarity of the ordinance in my opinion. <laughs> All right, um, Chris and then Jamie. Yeah, I think for me, the rationale between behind relying on it or allowing it uh, was that CAPE is, I, I assume, somewhat unique, um, but maybe I'm wrong, um, in that I, most towns often have what's uh, referred to as a merger clause that requires uh, non-conforming lots that are next to each other to be moved into a single lot. Uh, CAPE doesn't have anything like that, which is kind of weird which has been source of some of my, my consternation with this town. Um, but presumably if you have two lots that you own in a single ownership next to each other, there would be nothing keeping you if you wanted to jump through the legal hoops, maybe there would be something, I don't know, of just combining into a single lot. And if you had a single lot with two, prop, two buildings on it and you'd be able to rent that on host, uh, you'd be able to rent that short term because we, at one point we're gonna let accessory dwell dwellings be used or short-term short rental, I don't know if we do it or not. But it seemed like we at that point we're drawing arbitrary distinctions. So the way to look at it was, if it's literally abutting your lot such that your two lots could conceivably, if you met whatever requirements, be merged together, then just go ahead and let them rent. Yeah, I, I, was, just gonna, I was just gonna add to that. So it was purposeful and specific language that's in in the text of of the the detail on um that that property type so even even though it says short-term rental adjacent as the as sort of the header all of the language throughout is about an abutting lot and so at multiple meetings did we have conversations just like you're suggesting jeremy of oh well you know uh, it's just across the street and so on and and we determined early on that if we if we stuck with that broader adjacency um, sort of threshold that we were opening ourselves up to exactly the type of subjectivity that you're describing and so um, the the language was was carefully crafted to say it has to be an abutting property the other thing i would say is uh, and this applies as a more general statement um, to the ordinance as well is that there's very few examples of these. Um, and so I, I, I would encourage us um, to focus on the areas of the, 
the ordinance that have the broadest applicability um, to the most number of properties rather than get too wrapped up uh, in, in nitpicking on what may amount to literally like a handful of properties in town. So that, that's what I'd say about that. Um, Jeremy, having heard those responses, did you still want to flag that for review? Um, yeah, I, I, I think I do. I, 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 yeah, and I know we're just flagging stuff now. So. Okay. Um, Penny, do you, did you have something else to? Yes, I, uh, number one, agree with uh, Valerie rather re relative to length of uh, stay. Um, um, hosted, unhosted. I also, the seven acres which you brought up, uh, Valerie Adams, I also think we need to talk about um, large parcels with contiguous properties, um, which I don't know is really covered in here. Um, example being um, Ram Island um, and that uh, that large parcel in town. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a way, and I think the introduction really um, helps do this. It's, it's really what we're focusing on are our neighborhoods and uh, the impact on neighborhoods. And I wanna make sure that we, um, we stick with that and um and understand that not everything in cape elizabeth is a neighborhood um and so that's why there are some um uh, exceptions that are identified okay um and let me just look at my notes because i had flagged something Well, you're looking at your notes. Uh, basically, Penny's point is my the crux of my issue, in that um, I feel like we needed to craft this not as an across the board ordinance across town, but to actually craft it to match the neighborhoods, which I feel like it doesn't do. Um, and I wanted to have some more discussion on the um, hosted versus non-hosted aspect um, and the rental periods, which I think we already brought up here. Okay, so. Um, Let's start with the fees and penalties. Um, it sounded like, Valerie, you were saying we need to have um, actual monetary penalties. Is that, is that accurate? Well, that's how I felt. I, I understand what um, the Ordinance Committee has put together and where they're coming from. I wouldn't object to the way it is written. However, it just seems that a two or $400 penalty for somebody who is, who's willfully doing this is very different than um, if you said, okay, it's a thousand dollars a day, you have to get this thing registered or you're gonna pay a thousand dollars a day. It might be more of a deterrent, but if the rest of the committee doesn't believe so, then um, I'm fine with it. Um, so one of the issues, Penny, do you have your hand raised anew or is that raised? Okay. Um, one of the issues that I think exists with just having a penalty in the form of a permit suspension is that there may be individuals who just some say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get a permit and I'm going to continue operating the short term rental. And so it doesn't matter if you suspend the permit because they're not going to get one and they're going to continue to operate non-permitted. So 
it seems like we need some sort of fallback um, monetary penalty. And I kind of like the idea of the, um, the one that matches their rate that they're charging. So that makes it a little more um, not, not equal, but it sort of evens the playing field and doesn't unnecessarily levy large monetary fines on smaller operations. Um, Jamie and then Penny. Um, I'm not opposed to that. I, it, one other non-monetary way of handling it though would be um, once the person was identified as operating without the permit and was told you have to get a permit and because you're late you, it's double the fee that there be some sort of clock that starts at that point and they have seven days to do that or something and if they don't then they won't be issued a permit and won't be allowed to operate um and you know they they the other the other part that i think people are forgetting about this is that the way it's supposed to work with host compliance and all the platforms that they're marketing on is that they have to display their permit number so there's an incentive to to have the permit because they'll be out of compliance and and the way I understand it works is that uh, you know they're not able to list and they're not able to rent without that so um, once once the you know all, all of the all of the provisions and all the requirements um, it become sort of known to the platforms that they're working with and without that then they shouldn't be able to advertise the property in the first place. But um, so anyway, if, if, if there's, you know, that might be a reasonable compromise that if there's legitimate reasons that people, you know, maybe we're late, they get it turned in. Okay. They're, they're in good standing now and, and off they go. If there's the people that you're describing that say, yeah, you know, yeah, you found me and I'm not going to do anything about it. Well, you've got a limited amount of time to, to get in compliance. And if you don't, then, you get shut down. I guess my perspective is just that um, in my line of work, I have seen that when people want to break the law, they find ways to break the law and profit from that. So I feel like we need something there for those individuals. Valerie, um, we're making an assumption, I'm, I'm kind of agreeing with you, we're making an assumption that people are going to use uh, Airbnb type mechanisms to uh, rent their properties because they there's potential that people will through word of mouth rent their properties, which for short term, for a week at a time or whatever. So I don't know if there's ever a way to catch those, to identify them, because that's the, that's the way that I think about that if somebody were going to fly under the radar that there's going to be a word of mouth rental going on and not necessarily using uh, platforms that exist for wider um, um, access to customers. I don't know how you, how you ever attack, how you ever identify that. Right. And, and, and you may not, but, but then what happens if we do? And there's well, then, nothing then in the I'm audience. going to I'm going to be one of those people who would fly on who may fly under the radar. Not that I want to rent a place, but um, but if you then need to prove that the person people in the house were paying something, and how do you get to that point? How do you how do you identify that? I mean, that's sort of not the issue, though. The issue okay. is when when it does become apparent there's nothing in the ordinance that 
prevents those individuals from continuing to operate in violation of it. Yeah, that's what they intend to do. And so I just think we should have something in there, some kind of monetary penalty or some option for a monetary penalty for that scenario. I don't disagree with that. What would it, what, how significant would that be? Do you have a suggestion? I mean, I would say the, f the first offense should not be as heavy handed because it may be, you know, just someone who hasn't looked into the rules and doesn't know what's going on. Right. But a second offense I would do in the thousands, maybe $2,000 penalty for for that or five thousand dollar penalty even i think we kind of need to know how much the fee would be and then you could base the penalty fees off of that it's, it's hard to do one for the other well if i mean if someone's if someone's operating without a permit and they become then they, they have the one time chance to become aware of these are the rules this is what you have to do and they don't do it and they continue i think a five thousand dollar fee across the board is pretty reasonable um Valerie, i liked what i heard somebody mention a minute ago about some sort of equal to or a multiple of their average nightly or a average rental um i, I think that goes the point that I agree with Chris making earlier about um, sort of equity amongst different different types of homes and different different rental agreements and things like that. Um, Valerie, did you have a, a point on that? I, do. I, I think it may be too difficult to figure out what they are charging if they're not, if they're doing it under the radar. Um, how do you figure out what they're charging and who's going to calculate it? I think Valerie's idea of a nominal fee, whether it's a hundred dollars a day, something um, would work, or fifty dollars a day. But the second time, it's twenty five hundred, or it's five thousand, or it's it's a big amount because there are going to be people that, well, there might be people who just decide they're not going to get a permit, and um, they don't use Airbnb, they do it in other ways, and maybe people that are non primary owners um, who decide that that's what they're going to do. And I I think there has to be a consequence and. Um, and we can write it to where we file a complaint. We go to court and we get our attorney fees and our court costs, something to where um, we're covered if we have to take them to court. Um, Jamie and then Matt also has his hand raised. Go ahead after Jamie. So I, I think we're starting to get into an area where we're, we're making suppositions about what I expect would be a very small percentage of the activity and um, if, if, if much at all. And what we've heard from operators is that the reason that they're doing this is because the platforms make it easy for them to administrate the activity and all that kind of stuff. So if we're, if, if we're, I, I, I just, I don't see this driving a whole bunch of activity back underground because it's, you know, it, it's very difficult to sustain the same level of, of, of operation without the use and assistance of these platforms that are, you know, making the property uh, marketed and, and available for the booking and all that, you know, I, I think, I think there's a, a much smaller fraction of, of the folks that are operating that would continue to do so if, if they had to do that all that on their own and through other means and other mechanisms. But I, I, again, I, I think it's more productive for us to stay focused on the elements that apply to, you know, the most activity and will, will there be, there will always be people trying to break the rules. There will always be people looking for loopholes. There's, you know, practically no ordinance that we could craft uh, that won't have people seeking that out. Um, but I, I guess I, I just 
I really encourage us to stay focused on the aspects that apply to the most common use cases and the most common problems that we're seeing and not about hypotheticals that, that may or may not happen. But um, Matt has had his hand up and then Valerie. Just, uh, just one thought uh, regarding uh, rate. Uh, you may get challenged if you try to have a different, you know, a different rate for different properties based on what their weekly rate may be. But a way that you may uh, be able to work around that would be similar to how you assess taxes, uh, where you could have a rate set at a certain amount. And the thought would be a property that may be uh, more expensive would, would probably rent for more. Uh, as well. Uh, so if you had a waterfront property, it might rent, let's say, for $10,000 for a week. So if you set a rate at, say, 3% of or 2% of the property value would be the penalty fee. So if you had a million dollar property, it'd be, you know, $3,000 or something along those lines or, or you know, something like that. That way, it, could, it would be uniformly applied, but it could be driven by by value that way. And you could then you wouldn't have a challenge saying, well, it's arbitrary. You're just charging, uh, you know, Mr. Straw $5,000 and he only rents the, the property for $1,500 a week. Whereas uh, Miss Devereaux uh, is renting her property for $15,000 a week and you're only charging her that, that $3,000 fee. So if you can base it off the, uh, off the property value and then by a rate, you may be able to find that it's more uniform and, and more difficult to, to challenge as being, uh, arbitrary and capricious, which is uh, what you want to stay away from, I guess, and treating people, treating people differently, if, that, if that's helpful. Um, Valerie, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to respond to what Jamie said. I completely understand um, where he's coming from with that. But if we're going to create an ordinance, um, why create it, why make it easy for people to thwart it? Why not create an ordinance that has some consequences? Other towns have, um, have, even South Portland has this in their ordinance. And I know there's other towns across the United States because it has been a problem. So why not take care of it up front? Even if it's just gonna be a few people, why not take care of it up front rather than having to get code enforcement and everybody deal with it later, all of us come back, have to rewrite it why not just put a provision in there and um, create a consequence for um, people who aren't following the rules? Right, and I, I'll just make, I just wanna make one respond to Jamie quickly. We don't need to belabor this point anymore about the, the fee and, and these people who are probably in very much in the minority, but it just, it would be very simple to add a paragraph that just says, if you continue, you know, second violation continuing to operate without a permit fee, $5,000 done. And that would just catch those, those few people because it's sort of that logic that they say in the law where there's no remedy, there's no right. If there's no penalty, um, what's the point of all of it? And yes, there is some penalty in that they, they'll be, you know, not able to operate on those sites, but, it would just be very simple to also say, for, you know, we will also impose this penalty of a fee. Um, Chris, and I just need to step away for a second. Um, yep. Chris, I just ahead. wanted, uh, just so, I, I assume we're all on the same page, but just so everyone is on the same page, we're talking about uh, failure to get proper permitting, not uh, annoyance, uh, quasi nuisance behavior that happens at the property, because that doesn't even fall into this bucket. Um, and that type of activity isn't what these fees would uh, or these fines would be associated with. It's just the failure to do proper permitting. So with that in mind, do we feel that multi-thousand dollar fines are appropriate or is that really with the other behavior? Yeah, and I, I mean, I just want to say, I, I think I might have either not been clear in what I was trying to communicate or, or misinterpreted or, or one or the other, but um, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting to intentionally leave loopholes or, or, or not, you know, pay attention. To, I, all I'm saying is that um, I, I, think, I think we'll be more productive this evening if we focus on the elements uh, that 
try, try to bring us to a, a, a broader consensus on the elements that apply to most situations versus spending a lot of time deliberating on things that are um, either less likely to occur or much, much, um, you know, lower rate of occurrence or things like that. So I, 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 as, as we, as we continue through the discussion here, I, I'm just trying to keep us focused on, on the core of it and not all of the extraneous sort of satellite issues. But. Right. And I, I didn't intend for this point to take so long to deliberate, but I really do think that it's very simple and necessary to have just one just one paragraph that says, if you don't get a permit, second violation, hefty fee. Um, Penny, and then I think we should um, move on to primary residence language unless we're... I'm gonna, uh, Valerie Adams, I, I will agree with you. It doesn't take that much time to put the wording in here to capture it, because then we will have it captured. And then as we continue through the process of uh, public hearing and all of those other things, things may get tweaked. Um, I do like Matt's suggestion on, on a percentage of on, on value by our assessed value. I find that, I, I like that. Uh, but I could also go with a fixed fee of uh, 5,000. Do we have some consensus that we should put in a fee? Just raise hands in the raise hand feature. Okay, so we'll just, just throw in a fee, um, just sort of as a, not necessarily a placeholder, that sounds too late, but like Penny said, I mean, it will get tweaked, but just to put it in there. Um, Maureen, this is your document, right? You're sharing? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. So we're at... Well, I've been moving it around based on what you're talking about. Okay, I was looking at my own. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think probably it makes sense because it's separate from the other violations to put it in the permit area. Which is where it is. So what I would do is under the short term rental requirements where we talk about failure to obtain a permit. Um, I can rework it based on what you've said. Um, put in a fine. My question is, do you still want this not be able to obtain a permit for five years. I mean, I don't think that needs to go. I think that's important as well. Okay. Does okay. others agree? Just nod. Heads, yeah. Yeah, I think that stays in there. Yeah, I can put that in for you. Okay. Um, so the next one on the list is the primary residence language. Um, Do you want to see the definition? Yeah, I think that's what people were referencing is the definition of primary residence. Is that accurate? To, I can't remember who brought up the primary residence language point, but is that what you were referring to, the, the definition? Um, both the definition, um, which we, you know, we had, in the interest of simplifying, we had taken some of the other sort of evidentiary based um, forms or documents that somebody could show. Um, and, and so, you know, maybe we do need to revisit whether or not there's, there's multiple things that you need to do to demonstrate primary residence. Um, but also just generally speaking, um, I'm scrolling through here that, um, I forget where where the where the reference to it was, but it was it was read back to us in email about um, you know in in part part of the purpose was this was to prioritize I just remember that phrase to prioritize primary residency as opposed to 
more clear and definitive language that says makes it a requirement with the exception of these couple of instances. Um, uh, I'm just scrolling through because I can't remember where that passage was. So the, the comments regarding prioritize primary residency, that's in the cover memo that okay. went to the council. So okay. all that was trying to do is to describe how this, these amendments are a major shift from what we currently have. So, I mean, we can revise the cover memo, but- Okay, I thought it was from, I, I thought it was language that was also from the ordinance itself, Maureen. Um, regardless, yeah. regardless, I, I think, you know, what, whether it be in communication memos that are introducing it or in the language itself, I, I think, I think it would be beneficial to sort of step up the directness, for lack of a better word, about how um, this is the requirement and we have a couple of limited exceptions to that requirement. So. Councillor Adams? Yes. I, I, if the council is interested, I'd like to go over how the homestead exemption works. I, I talked to the assessor today and um, of course the manager is very, very familiar with this. So anything I misspoke on, he could correct me. Uh, so I have the, the language, the assessor gave it to me and uh, there are several ways under the state law that you can show primary residency, but the key piece is under the law, you must fill out a form and uh, it's provided by the state and you, in order to, to be considered for qualification, you have to sign the form. And if you sign the form and the form presents false information, basically that you're not a primary resident, uh, that's a class E crime. So, this is a system that is already in place. Uh, the assessor told me that he processes uh, over 200 changes in homestead qualifications every year as part of the purchase and sale of properties. In addition, he does an audit where he will just pull a certain number of homestead exemptions and verify by contacting the homeowner are you still a primary resident? He looks at addresses. Um, can somebody slip through the cracks? Yes, but this is a fairly robust system that has the force of state law behind it. Uh, and I just wanna make sure that, that that's clear that uh, it was one of the reasons that we liked it because requiring something like a driver's license um, or a utility bill, those can change within a week or two. And all of those other do documentation pieces were eliminated because this was really more of a heavy hitter. Um, do people have thoughts on J uh, Jeremy? Yes. Um, so I, I, I just, I have a question on this, which also relates to one of my concerns around the, um, the adjacent properties piece, um, which is just, so in my line of work, <laughs> Um, we find people who do all kinds of odd things with real property for all kinds of reasons all of the time. And um, so I, I just want to make sure, like we have a definition for tenant in here. There's no definition for owner. It is not at all an uncommon situation for uh, a property owner to have their property actually owned by a trust or a life estate of which they are the beneficiary, but not actually the owner of the property, um, and or to have a person who, one spouse who owns this property and one spouse for tax reasons who owns the adjacent property. And it just seems that, that um, it opens up a lot of complications um, if you have that around that concept of adjacency. Um, you avoid most of that by not making residency or ownership requirement with the seven acre plus parcels, but for the smaller parcels, I just want to make, you know, we could clarify that by adding a definition for the term owner um, or like, I, 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 I'll pose it as a question. <laughs> 
I just think it's not quite as simple as saying the primary owner's place of residence because the corporation doesn't reside anywhere. Do you uh, have a suggestion? I'll pose it as a question to Matt too. Matt, if somebody shifts their ownership to a, a revocable trust or some other instrument like that, do they still qualify for homestead exemption? No, uh, it needs to be uh, owned by that person. Oftentimes you run into that with LLCs or trusts. Actually, sorry, trusts can as long as they are the primary beneficiaries of the trust. So it'd be like the, the, Jeremy, Jer, the, the Jeremy Gabrielson Trust, Jeremy Gabrielson Trustee. So if you are the trustee of that trust, then the person is eligible for that. Uh, but if but then you have others who may have it in an LLC uh, for some uh, reason or others, so that does disqualify them. Uh, homestead exam, I'm sorry, a uh, life tenancy, the person who is the beneficiary of the life tenancy, say uh, you own the property and you give it to me, but you have a life tenancy, you are eligible for a homestead exemption as a life tenant. So that person would then be okay there. But, uh, but if I was the owner, but you had the life tenancy, I could not, uh, I could not get the homestead exemption, or or I wouldn't qualify. Uh, but you could because you have the remain, you know, yeah. I would have the remainderman, and you would have the uh, the life tenancy. Uh, it, it's 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 rare uh, in town. Uh, there, there there's a lot of trusts, uh, you know, and that that happens to be just with the, the nature of the real estate. But there are there are. Trusts are much more prevalent than life tenancy here, uh, but many times uh, we do have them and they are to, to the beneficiary or the trustee uh, and they have to prove that. And so you have to oftentimes take a look at the trust uh, documents to, just to qualify. And uh, so, so just to follow up to, on that and to Jamie's point of not wanting to spend tons of time discussing situations that may not be the common one, I, I feel like if you if you just get rid of the adjacent property requirement, you're going to get rid of you're going to simplify this ordinance and, you, and and eliminate a lot of those um, complications both around the you know who who qualifies as an owner um, and also um, just it eliminates an exception. If somebody still wants to continue to do a short-term rental, as Chris pointed out, they can they can go through the process of merging the lots. Um, that's a less onerous thing to do than going through the process of changing your legal residence from one state to another, which would be an option for a people who've written to us that have said that they live out of state and want to continue renting. Um, okay, so first, oh, Penny, did you have a follow-up to that? I think you're still muted, Penny. Oh, I just need to get a little clarification around what Jeremy was saying because it got a, a little uh, a little detail for my brain. Um, so you so can a trust be an owner? Is a trust an owner? I guess I I would suggest that yeah, a trust is the is the legal property owner um, for people who put their property into a, a trust. Um, and I would suggest if we want to keep the adjacency and if we want to keep the primary residence requirement for adjacency that we just, you know, are clear that properties that are owned by, you know, that owned, are owned by a trust and, and or, or something like that would qualify for that if that's what the council intends. So uh, how would that, we're, so you're saying it would be another definition? It, it could be. It could be a, a definition of owner that, that specifies the owner of a property is, you know, the person who legally holds the deed or is the pr uh, primary beneficiary of a trust established to, um, you know, benefit that person. Um, okay. I think Matt's Matt's comment on homestead exemption allays some of that concern. I didn't wasn't aware. I didn't could qualify for a homestead exemption if it was in a trust. But I think the the issue, especially with adjacency, also still crops up where you know for tax reasons, one spouse owns one property and one spouse owns the other. Are it, you know does that mean that they're no 
longer the primary owner. So, um, I've lost my train of thought. So, Sorry. Um, so what we're saying is that because one of the things that we had is if it's a, um, a non-primary residence and adjacent property, um, that there could be a, um, an unhosted short-term rental. In order for, and so what I hear you saying is that we need to have an owner definition here for that property. You, I'm missing yeah. something. Somebody's yes. got to unravel it for me. You lower your types. Maybe you can unravel the words for me because I think I understand where you're going. Number one, I, I, believe in adjacency and we put it in there for specific um, reasons. Um, but I want to make sure that we have covered the bases on that so that it's clear as to what, uh, how it applies. Jamie, did you want to respond to that? Um, well, more kind of add on. So I, I guess the, the thing for me with the adjacent properties is number one, there are no real known and present issues that are stemming from these properties currently. And they don't concern me from the standpoint of the growth and proliferation of short-term rentals in Cape Elizabeth because there's so few of these to begin with. So I'm not really sure what problem all, all the focus and attention on them is really looking to solve because I, I, I think what I recall from all of the ordinance meetings on this was that it's a, a, a sort of odd and esoteric use case that sort of more closely resembles, um, you know, a, 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 a either a hosted or unhosted stay because because the property owner is literally right there next door, um, and and we had some very you know specific examples given of sort of a you know a cottage and main house kind of situation and all that kind of stuff. So, I guess what but I've tried to stay focused on through this whole exercise is, you know, what is the problem and how are the solutions that we're bringing to the problem gonna, gonna address those problems? And I, I don't really think that there's a huge problem here that needs to be addressed and, or concern of, of massive growth in the adjacent property um, category. So I don't, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm not real worked up about it to be honest with you. Um, so oh, I just want to go And ahead. I have no objection to adding a definition of owner, though. I, I, I mean, that, that probably does make sense. Um, just in, in the definition section to say, here's what an owner is. It's either an individual or a trust uh, where, you know, the trustee is the, is the resident and all that kind of, I mean, I think that's fine. Yeah, does that, um, that, Jeremy, does that address some of your concerns? I, I think having the definition would help if we're keeping the adjacency piece in. I, I think just coming back to Jamie's point, though, that, you know, this is a rare set of circumstances. And so I, I, don't, I don't see the need to have it in there to address the three or four circumstances. I think we should focus on what the problem is and, and you know. But if it's not, then those people can't do it. We're telling other people they can't do it. Right, but it, I mean, they I, I don't. I don't think that. Lots. I don't think that they're. What's that? They could do it if they merge the lots. I mean, there's there's a relatively straightforward remedy that keeps coordinates simple and keeps um, somebody from coming back to the council and saying, "Hey, I've got this weird use case that's a little bit different, and there's only one of them." Okay, so we're, we're satisfied with the two spouse adjacent property issue, but um, Jamie, do you mind just repeating what you had suggested for an owner definition? Yeah, I was just, um, that the owner is either the, the individual or in the case of 
a living rec uh, revocable trust. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the trustee is the resident. So whatever those two, I guess, those are really the only two examples, right? There's, there's nothing else that falls outside of that. So you're either the owner in residence or the trustee of a trust that's the owner of the property and in residence. Okay. Yeah, and I think it makes sense probably to just put that in, unless anyone objects. The, in the beneficiary of the trust. That's the word I was looking for, the, the trustee, the, the beneficiary. Right, the beneficiary. Um, to just put that within the primary residence definition as instead of having its own little place. Does that make sense? Nod or object? Okay. Um, okay, so we just knocked out two points because we hit also the adjacent properties. Um, and Jamie, are you satisfied with the homestead exemption information in terms yeah, and of- Yeah, I appreciate Maureen reminding me about it too because that, I and the, the whole point about um, state statute is, I think, relevant because you've got, you know, that as a, as a hammer um, to wield in that situation, so. Okay. Um, so the next topic on the list is rental periods. And I think there were a couple of people who brought this up. I think Valerie and Penny, maybe. Um, so does one of you want to go into a little more detail about your concern? I think, um, I think we just are at that point where we need to come to some level of consensus. We have talked about that the uh, primary residence hosted that um, uh, the length of stay was, there wasn't any limit from my understanding. Um, and then the the crux of the issue had to do with the primary residence unhosted and whether that should be um, um, 30 days, 60 days. And I just need to hear others' opinions on it and rationale as to um, as to why, because we keep going to going all over the all over the board. And just to clarify your question, Penny, there's also a different number for the short-term rental adjacent. Did you want to discuss mm -hmm. numbers or one at a time? Yeah, yes. I think we need to talk about all of them, but we got to talk about them, I think, um, together one at a time and have some rationale for why we have uh, set on a number. Because we as a team at um, Ordinance Committee uh, talked about them um, several times and it was coming to this group in, uh, that we wanted to do in order to get input from the full team. Um, Jeremy, yes. So uh, I'll just get go ahead and say my preference would be um you know that so under sub points I, I don't i don't know that there i don't feel there needs to be a limit for category one the primary residence hosted but for two three and four i would like to see a consistent number among those three categories um and i don't <sighs> I'm not, there's not a particular number that I am fixated on, but I think that it would be, I think that consistency among those three categories would be beneficial. Um, yeah, I agree, consistency. And um, I think the 182 seems very long. That's a lot of days especially as compared to the other ones. Um, and I was also wondering, are those supposed to be consecutive days? So no more than 90 consecutive days per calendar year, or did you decide it was just total, so just total 90 days? Okay. I didn't think we landed on consecutive days, but 
Um, Chris and Jamie can correct me if I'm wrong. No. It, it basically, I didn't support these numbers, but I didn't want to hold this up in the ordinance committee anymore. So I just said, put whatever you want in. So this represents whatever consensus Jamie and Penny have. <laughs> whatever they say is what the consensus was. So I, I'm not a math whiz, but I don't believe that 90 is divisible by seven. Um, is there merit or value if seven days is the rental term in having a number of days that corresponds with the maximum number that you could attain? Like 105? Yeah, for example. I would give you 15 rentals, in theory. Um, yeah, J Jamie. Um, so first, just on the on 182 days, obviously, I, I don't have a, a strong expectation that there will be a number, you know, a great number of properties that are going to be renting out for 182 days. I also don't think that's divisible by seven either. But um, the, the obvious correlation to that number is that it, it corresponds to the number of days that you need to live in the property in order for it to qualify as your primary residence. Um, my whole point on this all along has been that if primary residency is the major prerequisite for being able to operate a short-term rental, that you're much more likely to have, um, you know, people that are doing it for, some may do it for 30 days, some may do it for 45, but they're, you know, the number of people we heard from who, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I do this to help pay my taxes. I'm away at the lake house for four weeks in the summer. So that's the time that I do it or, you know, what, what, whatever those cases may be. I think all of the problems that we're hearing about um, are all associated with, with properties that aren't primary residencies. So when you factor in the fact that for most of the year, somebody's going to be living there, I think it greatly reduces, not eliminates, but greatly reduces, you know, this six month, I, I don't think there's going to be all that many examples of, you know, there may be some, oh, you know, we winter in Florida and while we're gone, um, you know, uh, we rent out up here. But um, for the most part, I think, I think that's what it'll address. So yes, obviously by letter of the regulation here, it allows you up to that, but I, I don't think in practice that there will be as many instances of people actually doing it is my point. Um, as far as the other thresholds, if, if we're not, I, I, I doubt that there's support broadly amongst the council for that, which is fine. I, I don't have, I, you know, was there as a, as a point to start the discussion. Um, I know that we've gotten a significant number of emails saying as, as little as 14 days, which I think is um, completely um, absurd in the other direction. Um, and, and it, you know, the, 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 the folks that have been at the meetings and involved, you know, we heard a lot of people reasonably think that 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, somewhere in that window um, was a reasonable compromise. And I think that that's, that would be much more where I would land, um, it, you know, versus, versus 14 as an example. But So I think this is more just because I'm, I'm really on the other end of this and Chris as well for, for those of you who um, are in support of the ordinance, is there some consensus about the number of days that you want to have in here? Um, I don't know if people wanna, we could just all go through and everybody throw out your number, Chris. In, in conjunction with that, um, again, uh, what's been completely missing from this entire conversation, and for me it's quite telling, is any explanation how any of this fits in with the comp plan and the intent and the policy and the purpose of our districts. So as you throw your numbers out, if you can in any way tie that in to how it is in harmony with or accomplishes the comp plan, because we haven't had that discussion at all 
up until this point. So letting people stay in their homes that, uh, you know, have been having a hard time paying the escalating taxes, that's, I think, very consistent with the comprehensive plan. Jamie, what's your, what would be your numbers? Uh, I think it should be, I, I agree with consistency and uniformity. I would, I, I would push for no less than 90. Okay. Um, I was going to say 90 also. Sorry, I thought you had your hand up from before, Penny. I didn't mean to skip. Sorry. My um, hand is always up. <laughs> um, Valerie and then Caitlin and Jeremy. Um, I agree. I would say the 90 or 105 five days um, and then a, the hosted no limit. I, I'm just a little concerned about the non-primary residents of um, seven acres. Um, because if that's out like at Ram Island, are we going to tell them only 90 days? So I don't know if that, if that fits in. That's the only reason I thought maybe the seven acres might be a different category, but I'm fine if everybody wants to go with the 90 or 105 days. Yeah. I'm fine in that range too. I mean, in practice, we essentially have a 10 week tourist window. I mean, a little bit longer now with cruise ships, but cruise ships aren't, residents aren't typically staying in short term rentals. Um, so, you know, I don't, I, I think that something in that range is going to allow people to operate during the peak of when we're generating revenue anyway. Um, if, if that's what they're hoping to do. So consensus is 90 days. My turn, my turn. Oh, sorry. Yes, Caitlin. Um, yeah, I was just going to say 105 because it is seven times 15. So it gives you at least 15 rentals. Because I like pointed out that 90 is not, is not divisible by seven. But so I'd be more just 105 sounds better, but yeah, in that range. Okay, um, if people could just sort of nod if they want 105 versus 90. That's fine with me. Yeah. Okay. So I actually we... did raise my hand, Valerie. <laughs> oh, I see it. <laughs> yes, Penny. <laughs> I really wanted to add that um, the um, the ability for um, some of the larger land tracts to get um, a go before the zoning board of appeals and get a um, uh, what's the name of that thing? A conditional use permit. Conditional use. Yes. Yeah, I was just looking in here to try to find that section on conditional use permits. It's in the front, I believe. Do, 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 do. Where was it? Standards. Maureen, did we take that? I thought it was in here. Yes, you took it out. Oh. oh. I oh, think right. this is it, I think it it's a place flat. we want to use. Yeah, you had flagged it as an outstanding issue for further discussion. Can I um, present? Sorry, who's, who's talking right uh, now? Chris. Yes, uh, Chris, go I, ahead. I think, uh, uh, and Maureen, correct me if I misrepresent, uh, but uh, Maureen's uh, preference in 
with revisions with the um, zoning ordinance over the last few years is uh, not to add in um, conditional uses. I, on the other hand, think that they exist for a reason and they serve a very useful purpose. Um, but I think uh, people found Maureen more persuasive than me, so it disappeared. Or I should say it was removed because people didn't want it at that point. So maybe now that we're going through these revisions, we pull it back in. Um, yes, Jeremy. So I, I'm, I, I share Maureen's uh, dislike of writing in new conditional uses. Um, and, and I also, both for, for the reasons that I think she articulated around, um, you know, it, establishing the conditions is going to create a lot of difficulties for the planning board um, in terms of adjudicating whether or not the conditions are met, but also because the conditional uses would, would in theory, run with the property. Um, and that seems, you know, we're otherwise permitting an individual on an annual basis to engage in an activity rather than permitting a, a change in land use through this ordinance. Maureen, go ahead. You're muted. So, yeah, I am. I was waiting to find that. Uh, so I just wanted to be clear. First of all, Councillor Straw would never be more persuasive than me. Um, secondly, <laughs> Uh, the committee agreed to pull that out, it, there, and there are some problems. And one is that you would have to change your conditional use procedures somehow because a conditional use permit typically runs with the land. Second, I uh, want to make it very clear, this would go to the zoning board, not the planning board. Um, and it was the code officer who said, you know, depending on how you apply it. And I guess if you only apply conditional uses on the seven acre plus properties, it would be a little bit less of a burden. Uh, but at the time we were talking about a lot more getting scooped up under a conditional use. And um, his thought was the zoning board pretty much would be doing this every month. So it, it would be a, a big deal. And, and my main concern remains that, um, and I put the conditional use provisions in the earlier drafts so you could enjoy reviewing them and seeing that they tend to be very um, problematic when applying them and when defending them in court. Uh, so yes, my preference uh, has always been to recommend that instead of uh, having a conditional use review to actually figure out what you are concerned about and create performance standards. Okay, then can I throw this out because I'm gonna go back to um, a, a comment that I had early on. We started this and the and the introduction talks about neighborhoods. And, um, and uh, I really have a concern um, with applying the same, um, uh, I would say, rules and regulations to larger tracts um, of property that are, I know I consider them more rural in nature. And how do we address the fact that there is a 2,000 acres that um, is not going to touch a neighborhood or somebody has 10 acres that may not touch a neighborhood um, so how do we address that? Um, and Maureen, is your response still that the conditional use permit is not an appropriate way to do that? And I just need to excuse myself again. Sorry, uh, I'll be. Yeah, I, I would suggest um, instead of hearing me tell you again that the standards are problematic, that you might ask the town attorney. Um, taking those, I mean, you're, you're going to be asking the Zoning Board of Appeals to grant a permit in a controversial situation 
where the applicant has thousands of dollars of of motivation to challenge a negative decision by the zoning board and the neighbors are going to be very motivated to challenge the decision of the zoning board so you're probably going to end up in court with those somewhat problematic standards and trying to defend them and if that's the way you want to go absolutely i can write that up no problem i'm just providing you with my advice And the, the counter argument is that that, and of course your response can then be, well, that's why we shouldn't have it for those either. Um, but that applies to any of the existing conditional uses. And that goes to my point that uh, this needs to be tailored so it's in harmony with the comp plan and with the existing uses. And if we have all these other uses that are conditional use, but this isn't, when this is higher impact than those uses, it seems like there's inconsistency. And the way that I would solve this by not using a conditional use would have been to recraft the zones in town because I think they're too broad and I don't think, I think a good portion of the town is miszoned at this point. And we need to have more um, well-crafted zones. Obviously that's a much longer process, but it would address Penny's point that, what do you do with these large lots that aren't part of these uh, neighborhoods? And it's because we just kind of painted everything with a broad brush and created these very large zones that are very inconsistent within the zones. But again, that's a much bigger problem. So Maureen, is there an alternative to conditional uses? Um, I, I agree with Councillor Straw that um, you have three residential zoning districts right now and the RA district is 50% of the town. So if you want to regulate things differently by zoning district, you definitely can do that. But the problem is that the large tracks and a vast number of your existing neighborhoods are all in the residence A district. So mm -hmm. um, Councilor Straw is correct. If you wanna start dealing with these things differently, you'd have to create at least one more residential zoning district. And that is not something that you're gonna be able to pull together by January 1st, 2021. I mean, that has not just um, zoning ordinance uh, implications, but also revisions to the comp plan. And I'm not saying that isn't something that can be done. Absolutely can be done. Um, but it's, it's not gonna be done by January 1st. Can you do overlay districts? Again, I'm That's trying that. to think how that would work because right now, if you're not going to go ahead with Councillor Straw's recommendation to look at conditional uses, you're basically going to be listing short-term rentals as um, either a permitted use or accessory to a permitted use Pro probably fits depending on how, you know depending on how these land like the hosted and the unhosted with the primary residency requirement probably makes the most sense to treat those as accessory to um, a single family home or a residential use that that would work uh, we'd have to look at the others so i'm not sure how you would do the overlay I mean, typically, I mean, I'm not saying you can't do it, but typically the, Cape, the town of Cape Elizabeth uses overlay districts to deal with unique special uses. And this really isn't a unique use when you're allowing it in all the residential districts. You know, the past overlays have been used for telecommunication towers. Uh, we used one for um, the special event facility. And when you think about those types of uses, those are really kind of like, lightly dusted in a few places in town. Can I, so Penny, can I just ask, I, 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 I'm curious for if you can clarify what we would be accomplishing by adding either a conditional use of performance standards. I guess the way that I understand the logic of this ordinance, we're relying either on the primary resident 
to have concern around the impact that they're creating on their neighbors or the size of the lot to buffer neighbors from the impacts associated with short-term rentals. So, so I guess my question is like, what, what additional concerns would you hope to be addressing by having either conditional use? If somebody wanted to um, have short-term rentals for a longer period. Uh, longer than the 90 days? Yes. Or 105 days? Yes. So that's how I was originally willing to be on board with saying allowing short-term rental for like a week or like uh, two weeks at most. And then saying, if you want to do more, you have to jump through these hoops and all the neighbors get some input. We make sure that for your property, you're not impacting all water, things like that. And having some type of conditional uh, mm -hmm. approval process where we ensure that the neighborhood has say in that it is in fact compatible with the neighborhood. But absent something like that, uh, I, I, I'm simply not on board. But that's like Penny said, it, it would be, we set a very, very low number, but then you can get the higher number if you jump through these hoops and demonstrate it's compatible with the surrounding properties. My, my thought, Penny, is that why not just say the seven acre plus, they have 180 days, why not just give them a number? And we have, um, we have our violations. We have if they cre if the, if there's a problem, if there's um, a violation, they'll lose their permit. So I think that just saying okay, if they get 180 days solves that. I don't disagree with that. I'm sorry if I missed this and you already talked about it, but did you go over the the um, seven plus acre properties that are not functionally those large suit you? No, yes. No. Um, so should we clarify? in that seven acre plus paragraph that these have to be a certain distance from the neighbors? I know that's kind of the assumption that they will be, but someone brought up in one of the ordinance meetings, a specific property that was seven acres, but the actual house was very close to the neighbors. Do you have your hand raised on that, Penny? No, I forgot to put it down. I, I don't disagree with that, that we need to have some sort of uh, setbacks of some sort. Um, I just don't know what that is. Maureen, do you have any suggestions on that? Uh, well, the, I, think, I think you need to take a moment to think about what you're trying to accomplish and then we can get there. So typically setbacks are um, from property lines. And it sounded like your, your main concern was if someone's house was close to another person's house. And, you know, if someone has a very, I mean, the, the, the scenarios were out there. And if you think about it, if you're talking waterfront property, you could have seven acre lots, but all the homes are very close to each other because the lots are more uh, long and, and they are grabbing that that acreage right next to the water. So even if it's seven acres, you could have houses that are 60 feet away from each other. So um, you could require that there be a setback that's a certain number of feet from your property line. Um, oh, that was the other problem. So even if you did that, uh, the other complaint we hear is people recreate outdoors. So it's almost like the problem isn't so much that the house is near the property line, but that the renters are out there having a good time. And so then you would have to establish a setback from the area where the renters were allowed to use the property. And that became extremely problematic. Uh, I'm just curious, Maureen, are we having any um, problems with those type of properties now? It seems to me that the problems are in certain neighborhoods that are very small lots. 
Um, and I know that on Ram Island, they were talking about cottages were fairly close to each other, but they've been renting them out for years that way. So it, it just seems that by creating um, more restrictions in this ordinance, it's just gonna become more confusing rather than just saying seven acres gets this amount of time. And if there's a violation, this happens, this happens, this happens. Um, especially since we haven't had any problems with any of that. That's just kind of my thoughts on it. That's, a, that's very reasonable. Maybe we just leave it as is. And was the, the length of rental resolved um, on the seven plus acres? It's 105 days across the board for categories two, three, and four. Okay. Okay. I thought we just had talked about uh, 180 for the seven acres or greater. I think Valerie uh, Devereaux put that out there. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, is there a consensus that that's more appropriate for the seven acres plus? Caitlin, Penny, Jeremy? Jamie, Penny? Do you, to, do you want us to raise hands? Do you want us, what do you want us to do? Yeah, I can't see everyone with the screen sharing view. Um, so if you could just so raise- it turned out, it turned out I, I was wrong earlier. 182 is 26 weeks. Yeah. So, so 182. Okay. So 182 for, um, so categories two and four are 105 and category three is 182 along with category, oops, okay. So 182 for category three. Um, okay, Caitlin, was that just your, your vote or did you want to add something? No, that was just my vote. I thought you wanted the hand up. I'll put yes, it down. You did. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, is length of stay resolved? No more points on that? All right, um, subletting. Someone had brought up subletting as a concern. I can't recall who it was. Um, do we want to throw in a quick paragraph that just says subletting of short-term rentals by short-term rental tenants is prohibited? Uh, Jamie? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think that was absolutely an intent and maybe just something we all assumed based on all the discussion around primary residence, but I, I would, I think it definitely a CYA kind of addition, so. Um, I don't know, Maureen, if you have a thought on where that would fit most appropriately um, with your ordinance crafting skills. I'd like some time to kind of look around and figure it out and then show it to you. How's that? That sounds good. Okay. Um, and then the next two I had were Penny's, uh, or I had Penny's point, focus on impact on neighborhoods. Not everything is a neighborhood. Um, do you feel like that's kind of been resolved by the seven acre plus discussion, Penny? Yes. Okay. And Chris, craft it to match neighborhoods was your point that I added to our list. Um, Which again has not occurred at all from my position. There's how, how is this a lesser impact than um, a daycare, uh, a six or seven kid daycare center. How is this uh, compatible with uh, residential? Jamie's point was, oh, it allows people to stay in their homes. But if that's the basis for allowing this in, let's let nuclear power plants in all over town because people can stay in their homes that way. So it, the ability to make money cannot be the triggering criteria for making it compatible with, with the district. Um, so, and we're still doing almost across the board 
RA, RB, RC are all being treated the exact same. So issue still stands, but again, I'm already voting no, so go ahead and ignore my point. Um, I, I hear your point, Chris, and I'm also already voting no, but um, in the spirit of moving this along, that, yes, Valerie? Um, I had one more thought, um, and I don't know how close you are to the end here. Um, what about some sort of a moratorium on um, short-term rental reservations until we have the ordinance completed? Do we want to discuss that tonight too? I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah, there were some points in the in the memo. Um, one of them was about the transition. Town council adoption should include language that formalizes transition from current standards to the new provisions, and that, that might be a good place to put in something about a moratorium. Um, and is there is there currently any language? I don't think so about the transition. It's the effective date. Um, so the paragraph, so it's on page 10, line 43. Um, I, does anyone have a suggestion for, for that kind of transition language um, to include perhaps a moratorium? Um, Valerie, do you have your hand still raised or did you have a suggestion? I didn't really have a suggestion, but I'll, let me think on it for a moment. Okay. Um, and while we're thinking on that, um, the, th the third outstanding issue that wasn't kind of in the list that we generated for discussion um, was third party enforcement and permit fee. Um, when that note was added to the memo, was it intended that we put something in the ordinance about this or just that on the agenda um, at some point, we authorize Matt to um, contract with this agency or something. Yes, Maureen. I think it's just, we don't wanna let that slip through the cracks. Um, you know, this, this, adopt, this ordinance still has to go through the planning board, then it has to come back to the council. So I think you just need to adopt a fee before when you adopt the ordinance. And you okay. can do that at the time you vote a vote on adoption. So we'll just make sure to that, that follows along with this. And um, Madam Chairman, if, if I may, uh, yes. we have gone out to RFP for uh, that third party enforcement. So we should have that uh, packaged up and ready for council. Uh, at the time that uh, we want to go forward. So uh, we will have that all deployed and ready as well. Great, okay. Okay, so unless there are, um, yes, Valerie. Well, I was just thinking that um, really the effective date is going to be determined when we, um, actually when we vote on the ordinance, because right now we don't know an effective date, but we could um, vote at a regular meeting on a moratorium, if we want to do that, um, a moratorium on reservations. Because my guess is people are going to be setting up reservations now for next summer, and some of them might not be primary owners. So we might want to put a moratorium in effect so that they're not, um, blindsided if some of them haven't been watching our meetings. Sounds like something we might have to do though by a vote at a meeting, regular meeting. Um, Matt, yeah, Matt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think that's something we could, uh, we could reach out to our uh, attorney on uh, and have 
language prepared for uh, either July, uh, you know, July council meeting or uh, August council meeting. If it would be best uh, to have it sooner rather than later, uh, I could we could work with the attorney to have some uh, form of a, of a moratorium language crafted and ready to ready for deployment, and then we could line that up to have it ready, uh, you know, to line up with when the council ends up. You know, it would expire at the time that the council adopts the uh, adopts the ordinance or uh, or adopts an effective date as part of that ordinance. So we could line those up as well. Does that, by a show of Zoom hands, sound good to everyone? Great. Okay. Um, so in terms of the transition language to someone on the ordinance committee um, have a thought about what what was intended by that note as an outstanding issue for further discussion i'm not really sure exactly um, what that means and whether that's something that we want to put in here or whether it's covered by the moratorium no I think, I think it, from my perspective, it was um, that we as a, a, a group needed to discuss that and yeah, and moratorium might be, might be part of it, but we needed to see where we were ending up from a timing perspective of moving this, uh, moving this forward and um and ideally put the uh transition date in place i think it was more of a, a conversation i don't know chris and jamie you can correct me if i'm wrong no no correction so i'm assuming Oh my, um, <laughs> because I, I agree with Valerie Devereaux a, a thousand percent that we need to make sure people aren't blindsided and we have to lay out what um, we kind of have to back into some uh, dates here um, or, or forward plan it. So um, if we look at where we're at, from a this has to go to council, then go to planning board, then go to public hearing. Um, and we are ideally hoping to have this implemented or in place the first uh, uh, in January 2021. Um, so it is about starting the, um, the migration at this point in time. And we started it with a moratorium on new short-term rentals, and now we can um, address ad having people book rentals after a certain point in time. Matt, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, the question, question I uh, have for council is, uh, are you comfortable after this evening's work uh, to have Maureen institute the changes, do the edits, and then bring them forward, and we can have this uh, for the council meeting uh, for July, and then uh, to be uh, for the council to review it, and then send it to the and, and then to refer to the planning board at that point. Is that uh, I'm just trying to pick up uh, pick up what uh, direction the council would like to go in on this, and we're happy to oblige. Just want to make sure you're comfortable with that as an approach. I think that makes sense. Um, Jeremy, did you have something to add? I was just using the raise hand zoom function to say I agree. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess if anyone disagrees, please speak up. But I think that sounds like a reasonable um, plan. Okay. So we'll have, uh, if, 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 if I'm just to continue, Madam Chair, uh, uh, so we'll have two elements available for the council to consider in July, and that would be a moratorium language uh, on new reservations, as well as uh, the referral to the planning board. Uh, uh, we'll have that prepared and ready to be referred to the planning board. Great. Perfect. Thank you. 
Um, okay, anything else that, that anyone feels was missed in this review or needs to be brought up or edited? Yes, Valerie. I, I'm just not sure if we need to talk about um, the complaint process. How, how do residents um, file a complaint? Is that something we'll talk about later? Do we want sort of a hotline like um, South Portland does? Um, is it something we'll put a page on our website? Do we want to talk about that now or is another time better? Because I think that's an important piece to this is how, how um, enforcement happens and what people, what their procedure is. So I actually, I had that thought earlier and then I reviewed um, on page nine, starting at line 12, the um, suspension and revocation of permit section. And I think it lays out a pretty good process for a complaint um, that um, the police department or code enf enforcement officer shall visit the property, police department shall generate a report of facts. Um, I think that maybe with the recent complaint that we had, the issue that came up via email was that um, the police department was not certain of what they should do or how they should handle it. Maybe we need to sort of make that a little more clear. Um, I don't know if it's in the ordinance or just in education. Um, Chris and then Matt, go ahead. In, uh, to reiterate the point I made earlier, this is for complaints about violation of the permitting. It does not encompass, in, and if I'm wrong, someone please correct me, it does not encompass uh, a group of people sitting outside smoking cigarettes at two in the morning, uh, talking very loudly right next to the neighbor's uh, a window. It does not encompass a group of people showing up and swearing and using foul language near, uh, near a small child that lives next door. It doesn't encompass people speeding up and down the roads in small neighborhoods and in cul-de-sacs. This is just for complaints with respect to the permitting is my understanding. And if I'm wrong, someone please correct me. I agree, Chris, that's really all it covers. It doesn't cover any of those uh, nuisance type complaints that occur. And that's why these are not compatible with residential neighborhoods. Um, Matt. Except when, except when the property is owned by a primary residence owner, um, number one, they're much more likely to be there and much more likely to be involved. And please feel free to show me the long list of complaints we have about um, those types of properties because I don't think it exists. Matt, did you have a response to that? I do, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't uh, getting, uh, I didn't want to interrupt uh, Councilor Garvin or, or Councilor Straw. Uh, uh, the two, yeah, the, we have two different avenues that we're traveling uh, on the conversation. The, the part that uh, Councilor Straw was identifying would be more along the lines of, of a police uh, enforcement event uh, where it'd be, you know, if you had, you know, just like in any neighborhood, if someone was out at two in the morning and, uh, and, and raising a ruckus that you would call the police and then they would respond accordingly, just uh, as in any neighborhood. Uh, this, uh, Councilor Straw is also correct in looking at this, that it is an ordinance uh, enforcement, so that would be with the code enforcement officer. Uh, the confusion that uh, was run into last week was uh, with the emergency ordinance enforcement versus the short-term rental uh, uh, ordinance enforcement. And uh, just kind of getting, <laughs> pardon the pun, but uh, getting the streams crossed there a bit was the challenge because uh, what we had there was a violation which would have been like a miscellaneous offense and it was the uh, province of the police department to respond to that under the violation of the emergency order that was enacted by the council. And, uh, but from this, you know, with, with violations of, of this ordinance section, that would be the code officer's responsibility to, to enforce and respond to. Uh, 
after June, well, presumably after June 30th, when the emergency order uh, expires, uh, violations of the S of the short-term rental uh, ordinance will go back to be the province of the code officer, with response obviously by the police department, as it's, as it's uh, displayed here, where they would go and investigate and then provide that information to the code officer, who would then say, okay, we have a complaint uh, of this, and it's a violation of of Section G uh, or uh, or uh, let's see, section G of the of the short-term rental ordinance, uh, subsection one, and uh, and pursue it from that way. Uh, so that's a, uh, you know, there was a bit of a challenge there, but I, that that would be the same procedures that you would do going forward. My point is just that we have we have dozens of properties throughout town that are currently operating as. Um, short-term rentals where the primary resident is using it as an occasional supplemental use and there aren't those problems. And so there's no reason to believe, uh, in my opinion, that that pattern of behavior will change substantially um, when we spread that same rule across to other properties that are currently non-primary residents owner occupied. It, my counter would be that I guess it's a it's a philosophical difference in opinion on how to approach zoning, and I totally see your point where you're, but I, I view that as a reactionary approach, whereas I take a more proactive approach to try to cut off the problems before they reach the point um, that we're hearing constant complaints. But I totally uh, I, I I hear your point, and it, there is some validity to it, but my view on the approach that we should take with the zoning is that we can see the problem coming, in my opinion, we stop it before it becomes an issue. Because otherwise, once you have people already engaged in the activity, it's much harder to then rein it in. Because suddenly we have people like the woman who uh, uh, talked earlier who said, I bought this with an assumption I was gonna be able to do this activity. Now you're looking to curtail that, but I already acted assuming it would be available. So that's why I believe we should take a proactive approach but you're absolutely right. Uh, one risk of that approach is you could overregulate. I mean, I don't think that it would be too much of an overregulation to add something about like repeated complaints, repeated substantiated complaints, but I think it gets difficult when you try to hammer out the definition of what those complaints might be and jamie yeah I, I, we talked about this a lot in the ordinance committee and this is i think the thing that we all struggled with the most because when 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 i say that you know we're trying to right fit a solution to a problem this is the the glaring area where there's nothing in here that quite specifically head-on addresses the problem. I'm, I'm putting all my chips on the fact, and, and I may be proven wrong, and, and if I am, then you know there's further curtailment to the activity that we can always take, I guess, but um, I'm putting all my chips on, on the, the sort of marker that is, if people have skin in the game in the, in the investment in the property where it's their home, um, the activity that happens there has generally proven to be quite different. Um, when we brought the police chief in, when we brought the code enforcement officer in to, to hear their concerns about effectively um, carrying out anything that would involve, um, you, you know, enforcement and punitive measures for behavior that, you know, when they roll up to the house, they might not even know if it is a short-term rental, right? So, you know, how, how are they to know how to treat that any differently than, the you know the keg party that I'm having at my house you know one Saturday night right um, and that their policing method is one where they generally try to in a community policing manner educate and de-escalate and not you know come in and start writing citations and summons and things like that uh, you know uh, straight out of the gate so um, you know so there there's there's just a lot of I, I think problem where we're sort of rubber meets the road where it's you know I think easy for us to say well why, why can't you just do this and, and in, in practice it becomes a lot more problematic. I, 
I, I, I understand what you're saying, Chris, and, and I, I would say, you know, by taking this step about making primary residence the threshold, that is the proactive thing that we're doing that is, is trying to, to head off the problem and, and that that's not a reactionary measure that that is proactive in so much as that you're defining a much more narrow set of criteria uh, enabling people to engage in this, um, this type of um, uh, operation. Could we just have a show of hands of um, who is satisfied with the ordinance at this point? Okay, so Caitlin, do you think that something else needs to change? Sorry, my mute was on. I said, your audio cut off for me after a show of hands. What do we do? Oh, like my... um, whether you're satisfied with the ordinance at this point. Yes. Okay. I'm good. Um, I mean, I, I tend to agree that we could maybe do a little bit more, but at the same time, I'm also not gonna vote for the ordinance, so. Um, Penny, did you have your hand up anew or is yeah, that? Yeah, I just, um, I think it's the, I think it's the best we can do at this point in time because I, we grappled with how you bring in that nuisance part and, um, and it, and it's missing and, uh, to incorporate it, um, like Jamie said, after listening to Ben and 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 Paul, that it just seemed that it would get um, too convoluted for them, uh, for their their work and what they try to accomplish. Um, I I just I just think it's the best we can do at this point in time, and I think basing it on um, primary residents is. Uh, the best ticket we have at this point. So that's where I come from. Jamie? The only, the only other thing, you know, I had thought about previously, um, and we, we never really explored very, very thoroughly was, um, you know, if kind of like on what you were talking about before, Chris, about conditional use and people coming forward and saying whether or not it was compatible, like at, at the time of almost like how we treat liquor licenses and, you know, um, that kind of thing where, you know, every, every month almost we have a liquor license that's up for renewal and the clerk or the chief or whomever say, oh, you know, there've been any complaints and we sort of qualitatively evaluate that. I don't know if there's some component that mirrors that process um, where, look, if Ben's got a file full of emails and stuff, you know, the, the thing that I struggle with is that it, it incentivizes people to just sort of complain somebody out of operation, potentially unjustifiably, right? That if they just, you know, create a big enough book of, of complaints and a thick enough file that you know, and, and I also am sensitive to overburdening Ben and the rest of the staff with sort of the investigative process there and, and uh, you know, fact finding and all that kind of stuff. But I, I, I don't know if there's some element of like, you know, yeah, yeah, you're in good standing sort of qualitatively in some way, some, some sort of subjective measure of that, um, that, that is a prerequisite for at least for renewal um, so, you know, the, the year may have gone by and you've got, you know, however many police calls out to the place and stuff like that, is that demonstrative of, you know, enough question to say, hey, I'm not sure whether or not this should be granted, but I don't know what that opens up, us up to either for challenges, but that's, that's the one way I thought, you know, we might be able to devise a, a mechanism to address this. 
I don't know if there's something we could put in the review procedure, um, which currently says the code enforcement officer shall issue a permit or a, a short term rental permit shall be issued. So it, it doesn't leave any discretion. I don't know if there's a way to give him some discretion and say, um, you know, in the last section, it does say, you know, maybe subject to suspension if the property becomes non compliant. Could it also say, you know, the code enforcement officer may deny a permit? But then it does get really tricky trying to figure out what that second part of the language would be. I mean, it could. Would just... it be the Would it be the the Board of Zoning Appeals that that would deal with those if people challenged it, or how how would that be handled, Maureen or Matt? I, so I if, if somebody was denied, if someone was denied effectively for cause, um, what, what's their recourse? I would think it would be, and I'm not sure if the, the I haven't seen it in the amendments, but uh, generally uh, uh, what you do is you have an administrative appeal of a decision by the code officer would go to the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, at that point where a person would be able to appeal the, the decision of the code officer. So they would have- So unlike, unlike Maureen, your concern around conditional use permits and if we granted if we opened up that door they'd be doing them every month and you know multiples a month i would think that just based on the the example cases we have before us of literally about a half a dozen sort of known problem properties that if if permits were denied to those properties based on some subjective or qualitative measure that ben was factoring in and those people went to appeal, you're not talking about something that's going to burden or overwhelm the system. You're going to have to write something in here and that's where, where, that's where you're going to go yeah. down the rabbit hole because right now, you know, Ben can deny a permit because they haven't met the code and, or he could deny the permit because they didn't give him a billing evacuation plan or they don't have adequate sanitary waste disposal or they didn't provide parking or they didn't provide a rental agreement addendum or they are proposing to put more than two tenants in per bedroom. Right. That's it. And you'd be talking about adding another provision, which would be, have you been a good neighbor? Um, and so you're kind of back in the problem we have with conditional uses and that it's a very subjective judgment. You could say there's been too many calls to the police department. And as soon as we start talking about that, the very next thing you mention is, yeah, but what if people are just calling because they don't like their neighbor and they're trying to mess up the situation? Right, so but my, my point about it being different from the, my point, I'm sorry to interrupt, but my point about it being different than conditional use is that instead of setting a, 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 a relatively low and nominal bar of allowable use and saying everything above that bar um requires conditional use in which you you expressed i think rightfully the concern that if, if that was how we were going to operate then everybody would need to go to the bza all the time this i'm, I'm saying is would be in theory the reverse of that where for all those people that are operating you know as good neighbors and in good standing which as best as we can tell now is probably somewhere between 80 to 90 percent of the operators in town but for that literal five six seven properties that are the ones we keep hearing about and the ones that keep popping up and all that kind of stuff that those would be the ones that have been denied them for whatever number eight here would be for you know cause as determined you know sort of related to the good neighbor statute then those people could go to the appeals process and but that you're, you're you're not talking about in theory a high volume of those is what i'm saying can i just jump in for a second um i i need to head out and, and help relieve my husband from this time baby <laughs> do you mind taking over jamie through the adjournment no i i think we're probably close anyway but thanks you thank you thank you have a good night good night here valerie so th does that make sense Maureen? Well, look, I mean, my thought is um, I can 
I can try to see, I'll talk to the code officer and see if we can come up with a number eight and put it in the draft for you guys to look at. Does that seem a reasonable? Yeah, and Mike, I mean, I'm not trying to write it on the fly here, but you know, number eight, mm -hmm. code officer will, you know, review for, you know, review and assess any standing complaints within the, you know, prior year of operation or something like that. And, you know, evaluate appropriateness for reissue of permit or something like, you know, I, I, I don't know, that's not the right phrase either, but you, you know, I, I know you get what we're saying here. And I think if, if we were to be able to get that in there and have that as a part of this, my hope is that that would go a long way towards assuaging the concern you know, that we've all acknowledged it remains a gap, so. And, and I, I mean, I'm, I'll talk to Ben, we'll see if we can kind of come up with something, but the, the big concern is that um, the more squishy it is, the more subjective it is, the more vulnerable the town is to legal challenges. Legal so, challenges on its existence or legal challenges when it's employed? When it's employed. Yeah. And, so, and, you know, code officers, my experience with them is they are loath to deny a permit without a very specific reason. So to, to Jamie's analogy with liquor licenses, um, you know, in my time on the council, we have not had a liquor license come before us that had documented complaints. Is that you know, I, I recognize the concern about make you know empowering neighbors to put all property owners at risk of losing right to operate short term rentals. But is there some way of using that as a threshold that would either then boot the decision up to the council or? Does the council want to be responsible? to be on our agenda every month either. I mean, I was, I, I didn't catch that morning. Is the, it does the council want to be responsible for making the final decision on these types of permits when there have been complaints in the prior year? I don't think it matters which is the appellate body. I think it makes more sense for it to be the BZA, but, um, I, I'll say this, if, if, if you, if Maureen, if you and also Matt in, in any exploration you might be able to do perhaps even with host compliance um, on, on some sort of clause or provision here that addresses the, the still long sought sort of silver bullet around behavior and how to factor that in. We, we recognize not wanting to burden the enforcement officer and police department with um, having to try and um, deal with those situations in a way that's inconsistent with the manner they would deal with any other situation in town currently. But it, it feels like it needs to be somehow captured in the review process for further issuance of permits. So yeah, I, I would agree. I think there's I think there's a mechanism at least that we could probably craft uh, for the council to take a look at that would say, you know, something along the lines of the code officer shall consider uh, uh, the number of documented complaints that exist or are tied to this property as related to its short-term rental status that have been filed uh, either with his office or with the with the town of Cape Elizabeth Police Department and uh, in the in their decision to renew the permit and you know so we can figure out something along those lines uh, you know and that it could be and I think know, the other thing the other thing is if we can get language out there that is clear in its in its warning to operators that they are aware that um, if they have instances and repeated instances like this, then their ability to renew their permit will be in peril. That's not in the current language. That's not in the current regulations. So that would be a change and that would be an improvement. Yeah. Right now, there's no disincentive for them at all um to curtail that kind of behavior but if if their ability to operate is on the line because of it then that to me would step up 
their skin in the game or their need to have skin in the game. Yeah, I, I think we can explore that and try to come back with, uh, well, we can talk with Ben as well in the morning and I can reach out to other uh, managers and see what other towns may have uh, if there are, you know, there, there may be other vehicles that exist, uh, not specifically related to short-term rental, but where you may have a qualification standard like that. I think the liquor license uh, example is, is a fine one as well because I think you know, that's a really things. close analog. Yep, I agree. Does anybody else have any opinion or comment they want to offer on that? Okay. Is there anything else anybody doesn't think has been covered? Um, I, I don't have anything else on this ordinance, but just wanted to update the council and let you know that um, with apologies for being late, I was a little late tonight because the uh, I was attending the Fort Williams Park Committee review of RFPs for the master plan. Um, and I, based on the preliminary discussion, which I didn't get to stick around for all of, suspect that we will have an upcoming workshop item on that um, at some point in the near future. Okay. Um, thanks all for the um, good discussion. Uh, I want to thank uh, the public that we heard from tonight and heard from obviously through email and stuff like that. Um, I'll be interested to see based on this getting closer to something to put forward to the planning board, um, how people are, are feeling um, about where we've landed. So um, encourage you to keep keep communicating with us and keep participating in the process. Um, so if there's nothing else, we will adjourn for the night. I, I just want to say thank you nope. to the ordinance committee. I know you put in so much time and energy and all of the people who came to all of the meetings and Maureen, thank you all. You, you made it so much easier for all of us tonight by all of the work that you've put into it. So, um, thank you. Thank you, Valerie. That's appreciated. It's definitely been uh, <laughs> a laborious exercise, <laughs> um, and you know, I, I think I think we've all just tried to be focused on what's a reasonable compromise here for everything. So, I appreciate mm -hmm. the same spirit that everybody else has brought to the discussion. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. I'll take care. Good night.